Good morning to those of you in the Western Hemisphere and good afternoon to those of you in Addis Ababa. It's an enormous pleasure for me to welcome you to this presentation of our study last fall of transition in Ethiopia and of our visit to Addis in January. This was the most recent of the SAIS conflict management study trips, which in recent years have taken us to Saudi Arabia and Qatar, Israel and Palestine, Ukraine, Sri Lanka, and Senegal. We've called the report on Ethiopia between hope and peril, because that's where we think the country stood even before COVID-19 struck. This giant among African states has a political leadership and a population that yearns for more freedom and prosperity, but the risks to stability from embarking on a political and economic transition are great. Today's event will be divided into the five main areas our students chose to focus on for their research and writing. Jenna Wichterman, a first year conflict management concentrator, will lead off with a discussion of her own and two other papers on security and rule of law. Ryan O'Farrell, a second year conflict management concentrator, will then discuss the four papers on politics and governance. Christopher Merriman, a second year African studies concentrator, will present his own and two other papers on Ethiopian society. Lambert de Garnet, affiliated with SAIS's strategic studies program, will present three papers on the economy. Then Alexis Rorick, who spent her first year uh, at SAIS in Bologna, is now an American foreign policy concentrator in Washington, will present the three papers on international relations. Last but not, but by far not least, internet conditions allowing, will come Ebebe Ainete, senior analyst at the Institute for Strategic Affairs and a doctoral candidate in peace and security studies at Addis Ababa University. Ebebe was our guide and mentor during our 10 days in Addis, making our appointments, enlightening us on the inner workings of Ethiopia, and trying to keep us out of trouble, as he will again today. Thank you, Abebe, for consenting to join this first Zoom presentation of SAIS study trip results. When the presentations are completed, we'll proceed to Q&A, which you can participate in using the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom app. Please state your name and affiliation when submitting a question. I'll do my best to aggregate and moderate questions, which can also be addressed to the other students who participated in the trip, all of whom are assembled here on the panel and will be introduced later. I get my say in the introduction and conclusions to our report. The introduction is called the sharp turn at high speed, as Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has initiated a daring effort to move in a new direction. But the conclusion is called, there is still a lot to do, because there really is still a lot to do. Ethiopians themselves are the best people to decide how to do it, but we hope this volume of 16 papers by non-Ethiopians will contribute to their thinking. Finally, just a word of heartfelt thanks to Isabel Telpain Long, without whom nothing of this sort, the fall meetings with experts, the trip itself and the publication of the report would have been possible. We're delighted that she had the opportunity this year to join the trip. Jenna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Serwer. My name is Jenna Wichterman, and I'll begin by giving a little bit of a background into Ethiopia's current political transition. So to begin, in 2018, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came from within the, the ruling party, known as the EPRDF, which was previously very repressive um, and oppressive. And in, beginning in 2018, he began to institute a number of reforms, which you can see on the slide in front of you, including increasing media freedom, promising free and fair elections, 
allowing for political dissent, dissent and for the return of opposition parties and for initiating peace with Eritrea, among many other reforms. For all of these, he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019. However, there's been a darker side to some of these reforms. These reforms have been accompanied by rising inter-ethnic violence in Ethiopia, especially since the beginning of the reforms in 2018, which has led to about 3 million people being displaced. There are many causes behind the ethnic violence in Ethiopia, but I'll be focusing on those related to, to security and the rule of law, and I'll be covering the reports done by myself and my colleagues Rachel Atley and Aaron Sullivan. So first to begin with some of the long-term causes behind why we see the inter rising inter-ethnic violence in Ethiopia today. There are over 80 ethnic groups in Ethiopia, and because Ethiopia has had a long history of different dominant ethnic groups ruling and at times oppressing other groups, there have been a lot of historical grievances that have built up over time. In addition to this, Ethiopia is organized politically and administratively along the lines of what's called ethnic federalism, which you can see in the map before you. Ethiopia is divided into nine regional states or regions, and each region is ruled by the region, its own regional government. Most are named after the dominant ethnic group in each region. This was created by the ruling party in the 1990s, and it was a system which created, uh, created a situation in which each region has majorities and minorities but majorities have most of the access to political power in the regional governments. Many people argue that this system of ethnic federalism has politicized ethnic identity and further aggravated grievances along ethnic lines. In addition, for the last few decades, at least there have been border disputes between the regions over claims to land and natural resources. And this has also been a contributor to the violence we see today. Finally, Within each region, minorities frequently experience oppression and discrimination, and there are a lack of judicial mechanisms for enforcing these minority rights. My colleague Erin Sullivan wrote her chapter of the report on Ethiopia's legal system and the problems therein. Even though there are important group and individual rights enshrined in the Ethiopian constitution, the ruling party and the regional governments have consistently violated these and the judicial system has failed to protect these rights. First, the system lacks authority. The courts have no authority to interpret the constitution. That power is left to the legislative branch. Second, the system lacks independence. There's rampant corruption at times when judges will often take bribes in individual cases. And also this lack of independence applies to the judicial appointment process. Judges are supposed to be appointed by an independent body but in practice, appointments are made in secret by the executive branch. And finally, the system lacks trust. For both of the factors named above, uh, there's been, this has led to a widespread lack of confidence in the judicial system. There are also proximate causes. There's a reason we're seeing this violence rise, especially since 2008. Uh, so there's more short-term causes going on. The first has to do with Abiy's uh, political opening. Free, he's, which has allowed for greater free speech in Ethiopia, which has been wonderful, but this has been accompanied by a rise in hate speech and incitement along ethnic lines, which has led to violence. Additionally, there's been rising ethno-nationalism within the regions. This has been spurred on by ethno-nationalist politicians, especially in light of the anticipated elections. And finally, the security forces have been weakened and decentralized as a result of the reforms. My colleague Rachel Atley covered the security forces uh, in her chapter of the report. And it's important to know that in Ethiopia, there are federal security forces that are controlled by the federal government and regional security forces, which are controlled by each regional government. Since 2018, there's been increased buildups of the regional security forces. These regional security forces lack federal oversight and their existence is not entirely constitutional. And they're also ethnically divided. Because of this, they sometimes fail to protect minorities within their own region, which means that minorities need to flee in order to escape violence, which has led to the current IDP crisis we're seeing today. Some state special forces have themselves launched incursions, uh, violent border incursions across borders into the other regions as well. The federal forces lack the capacity to respond quickly to ethnic violence, which is why the regional forces tend to be the first ones to arrive on the scene 
although their response is less than ideal. Finally, my colleagues Rachel and Aaron and I have come up with some policy recommendations for the government of Ethiopia in light of the security and rule of law concerns. In the short run, or the first, the rule of law should be strengthened. In the short run, this looks like uh, strengthening federal legal institutions and building the capacity of the federal judiciary, making sure that judges are fully independent, well-trained, and the judicial system is professionalized. In the long run, there should be a constitutional amendment to give the federal Supreme Court the power to interpret the Constitution and exercise judicial review of legislation and not allow that to lie anymore with the le legislative branch. Both of these measures will ensure that the legal system is better prepared to protect minorities and ensure that Ethiopia's laws are just towards all ethnic groups. Second, there should be security sector reform. In the short run, the government should bolster the capacity and resources of the federal police to better manage security threats. The federal forces, which are more ethnically neutral, should step in to address ethnic conflict. And in the long run, there should be demilitarization and integration of the regional security forces into the federal security forces. Both of these measures will ensure that minority groups are protected from violence. I'll now hand it over to my colleague Ryan O'Farrell, who will be talking about Ethiopia's politics and governance. Thank you, Jenna. Um, so my name is Ryan O'Farrell. I'll be covering the kind of more hard political questions of the Ethiopian transition process, um, covering my own paper and paper of three other students. Um, Go to the next slide. So um, the first paper I want to cover is by Abi Gunner, um, covering kind of the, the protest movement that brought Abiy Ahmed to power um, and the government's responses um, to that protest movement, how it um, addressed or didn't address the uh, demands of protesters. So when the protests began, um, they really centered on um, the expansion of the capital into Oromia. Um, so the protests started as, as a, a, a quite regional youth-led movement against that, um, but quickly expanded um, against the EPRDF, EPRDF at large, and particularly the TPLF, um, over repression, corruption, um, lack of economic effort, uh, opportunity, um, and spread to Amhara region as well. Um, and so when Abiy Ahmed did come to power, um, you know, the reforms that were, were passed were, were very real. Um, there's public apology for the um, use of excessive force against protesters, um, civil uh, society organization law was reformed, um, substantial judicial reform, um, release of political dissidents, um, and perhaps most importantly, kind of the, the sidelining of the TPLF as the um, party transition to the Prosperity Party. Um, but a, a major problem is that you know, most of the people we talked to continually emphasized that youth unemployment was the root cause of unrest rather than broader political questions. And so their uh, means of addressing these issues were quite top-down, elite-led, um, big economic projects to increase employment rather than you know, bottom-up, people-led um, solutions that, that could, could really work. Um, and uh, kind of another aspect is that as the uh, reform process opened up the country, um, it also created a security gap. Um, and so it, it created a, a, a tension between opening up the country to, to deal with problems and the opening up of the country creating new problems. Um, go to the next slide. Um, so one of the, probably the most acute you know, political um, uh, change that has has occurred is covered by Ricardo Vinci's paper um, is the transition of the PRDF into the Prosperity Party. So the PRDF kind of as as it had been structured was a coalition of four regional parties, each effectively operating as a single party state within each of their their regions, but led by the TPLF as kind of a, a first among equals. Um, so as Abi came to power, um, he's transi uh, been attempting to transition this into a single unified national party, the Prosperity Party. Um, but this has opened up a, a bit of a Pandora's box of unforeseen consequences, um, you know, particularly ethnic strife um, as the 
EPRDF's tight control over the entire country has has weakened. It's it's created issues kind of between these different regional states. Um, and the other issue is that a lot of these reforms have been pushed through by Abi's own personal charisma and popularity, not through broad-based um, institutional reform. Um, and these, Abi himself has not won an election, um, so there have been kind of accusations of, of some level of illegitimacy. Um, so the elections, which are now delayed, um, you know, not only uh, over the summer, but also now apparently indefinitely with um, the outbreak of the COVID virus, um, th these elections will be crucial for um, cementing this new multi-party system. Um, so other papers in our section kind of cover two more of these specific um, unforeseen consequences of the liberalization process. The next slide. Um, so this would be my, my own paper. Um, about the rise of the Ormo nationalist opposition. Um, so while these protests in, in Ormia did help bring Abi to power, um, as he's uh, consolidated power in Addis Ababa and attempted to transition the EPRDF into this national prosperity party, um, it's provoked pretty substantial fears amongst um, Ormo activists over uh, the perceived centralization of power. And as these, these protests were you know, fundamentally demanding more autonomy, as the, the party has transitioned into a national party, it's provoked fears of centralization. Um, and so what that's led to is um, kind of a, a, a coalition of um, Oromo nationalist parties, both um, pre-existing opposition parties as well as um, the rep repatriated OLF, which was part of the um, kind of release of political prisoners and reform process and peace process with Eritrea, brought back this long-standing party. Um, and as these parties gather together into a coalition against Abi within Oromia, um, they could do substantially well at um, both regional and national elections. And kind of could set the stage potentially for a national opposition coalition um, that attempts to preserve uh, the more federalist, um, decentralized structure in opposition to Abi's uh, perceived centralization. Um, but it's quite fraught with risk because there's also a violent or mode nationalist insurgency as a splinter of the OLF. Um, so at, if the democratization process does not go well, that could fuel this growing insurgency. Um, the next slide. Um, so the other um, kind of unforeseen consequence of this opening process was covered by John Kay. Um, it's the Sadama referendum in the uh, southern region. Um, so the Ethiopian constitution for a long time um, has nominally uh, allowed uh, zones within regions to secede from that region to become their own regional state. Um, but the EPRDF had effectively um, prevented it. But with this opening process um, that has now been made possible um, and it happened in Sadama. Um, the, there was a large scale youth movement um, and a referendum into last year um, passed overwhelmingly over 97% um, to become its own region, um, but that also opens up kind of a, a new can of worms as um, basically any other region or zone within uh, a region can also secede. There have been movement kind of towards that by other zones. Um, and the conduct of the election raised some pretty significant questions about the 2020 election. Um, you know, minority groups not being able to vote, uh, fraud, um, and so any the, as elections go forward, the national election this can be a bit of a, a signpost for what will need to be addressed in the future. So uh, the policy recommendations um, kind of covered by me and my colleagues, um, perhaps the most important one is that policy making needs to be inclusive. Um, this transition process cannot be top down. It needs to include not only civil society, but also opposition politicians. It needs to be local, it needs to be regional, it needs to be national. Um, anything that is kind of 
put together at a national level and then forced down will kind of create these unforeseen consequences. Um, the government and the opposition must both practice nonviolence. Um, the opposition protests need to stay peaceful and the government cannot respond with force that it simply makes everything worse. Um, institutional reforms, they have to happen at um, a regional level, not just at a national level, because democracy needs to be broad based, not just at the federal level. And um, elections need to be free, they need to be fair, and they need to be monitored to ensure legitimacy. Um, and again, that's at all levels, local, regional, and national. Um, so I want to hand it off to my colleague, Chris Merriman, um, to cover the society session. Thanks, Ryan. So yeah, I'm covering the society section, and that included uh, three chapters, one written by myself on uh, Ethiopia's recent anti-hate speech law, another one written by my colleague Sue on IDPs and refugees, and a third one written by my colleague Julia Luando on human rights and economic development. I'm going to try to sort of look at some common threads uh, between the three chapters. Next slide, please. So on the one hand, we've definitely seen positive effects on Ethiopian society as a result of Prime Minister Abiy's reforms. One of uh, the clearest ways is through um, liberalization of the media. So we've seen in a you know, quick amount of time, journalists being released from prison and hundreds of websites being unblocked. As you can see on the right, Ethiopia's ranking in the Global Press Freedom Index uh, improved by 40 points or 40 places in just one year. So that's really uh, an incredible improvement. The Ethiopian government um, has also renewed its commitment to care for refugees. And so the EPRDF um, has always had a pretty progressive stance toward refugees. Ethiopia is the country that in Africa that um, welcomes the most refugees. Um, but the Abiy administration has committed in particular to providing jobs for these refugees. And that connects with the third positive effect on Ethiopian society which has been economic liberalization. There's been a focus on attracting foreign investment. And one way is that the Ethiopian government has tried to do that is through industrial parks. So on the bottom right, there's a picture of an industrial park in Hawassa. And basically industrial parks are areas where the government has you know, tried to attract foreign firms. And as you can see, you know, the machinery is, is new, the, um, the park is clean, and these parks are also pretty sustainable. And one other thing to note is that uh, these industrial parks reserve a portion of their jobs um, for refugees. Next slide. Um, however, on the other hand, we've also definitely seen unintended consequences of this liberalization. Um, so my colleague Jenna mentioned um, a rise in, in fake news, or she mentioned a, a rise in hate speech, and, and fake news has played a part of that. Uh, so whether it's you know, using platforms such as YouTube, WhatsApp, or Facebook. Um, there's definitely been an uptick uh, in fake news and um, people see that as having contributed to hate speech, which has also in turn contributed to this IDP problem that Jenna also mentioned. So in 2018, um, Ethiopia had 2.9 million new IDPs, which was the largest number in the world. On the right, we can see um, a secondary displacement site for IDPs. And what that means is that um, IDPs that were at one camp had to move to a second one. Um, and uh, this one in particular comes from the Gideo zone of SNNP region. And uh, this area between Gideo and Guji has seen uh, more than 1 million IDPs. And finally, uh, related back to the industrial parks, uh, labor rights groups have uh, documented poor working conditions. So that could be uh, verbal abuse, sexual harassment, uh, lack of overtime pay, uh, you know, short breaks or wage deductions for minor infractions. We have definitely seen uh, this you know, negative aspect of this economic liberalization. Next slide. So just to, to finish up uh, with some policy recommendations, I'm trying to uh, find policy recommendations that emerged across the three different chapters. So one thing has been the need to increase government transparency. So the Ethiopian government um, under Abiy was not very transparent initially with the problem of IDPs. 
they took a while to admit that there was a problem. And um, they also, their estimate of how many IDPs there are in the country is much lower than estimates of international organizations. The government also lacks transparency toward the press. So journalists complain about how there are uh, press conferences, how it's really difficult to get government officials to answer their questions. And journalists actually view this as helping contribute to Ethiopia's fake news problem because you know, there's been kind of a historical distrust um, on the part of the public toward the government, um, not believing what they say. And so journalists that, um, that we spoke with said that they thought that this um, you know, helped the Ethiopian public or pushed the Ethiopian public toward alternative sources of media. We also see the international community as having a role to play in pressuring the government of Ethiopia to protect vulnerable people. So that applies to IDPs and refugees. So um, Ethiopia has signed on to you know, global and continental agreements related to IDPs and refugees, but we see the international community um, as having a role to play in uh, you know, holding the government accountable and making sure that they live up to these promises. Um, with regards to workers, we see the international community is also having a role to play. Um, there are organizations such as uh, the NYU Stern uh, Business School and the Worker Rights Consortium that have documented uh, poor labor conditions uh, in Ethiopia. And um, what they've also done is, you know, held these global um, firms that are working in Ethiopia accountable to the promises that they made to, um, you know, protect workers' rights. And so in that way, the international community is able to, you know, put some pressure on these firms and also on the Ethiopian government. Finally, um, local CSOs have a role to play. On the one hand, they can document workers' rights violations in Ethiopia and then uh, link up with the international community um, and you know, spread the word on, uh, on that. And then finally, um, local CSOs can also help um, you know, improve uh, the media in Ethiopia. So on the one hand, the Ethiopian media lacks professionalization. And so there's problems in terms of you know, fact-checking and lack of objectivity. And so there was the recently formed uh, Ethiopian Journalist Association that is gonna help trying to you know, increase the level of professionalism. And finally, websites such as AFP Ethiopia have been um, fact-checking and you know, correcting misinformation to make sure that there's a high quality of information in the country. Uh, so that's it for me. And I'm gonna now pass it on to my colleague, uh, Lambert Guigene to talk about the economy. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. So in trying to examine the Ethiopian economy, my colleagues and I focused on three distinct but equally important areas. And that was the role of foreign direct investment, land-based conflict, and the risks of corruption in our efforts for privatization. So we'll take these issues one at a time. Uh, next slide, please. So in looking at foreign direct investment, it has been a stable indicator for Ethiopia's economic progress. Over the last 20 years, Ethiopia has posted an average 10% GDP growth. Recognizing its significance, the government has made foreign direct investment as one of its centerpieces for its homegrown economic reform. In an effort to transition from a largely agricultural based economy to a manufacturing led sector. It's also important to note that China is the most insignificant investor in Ethiopia. They invest heavily in manufacturing services, as well as in other low-skilled, low-wage jobs. China is by China invests more in terms of manufacturing in Ethiopia than any other country in the Horn of Africa. This relationship is very mutually beneficial. Ethiopia gets to benefit from increased investment in infrastructure and manufacturing, from as well as job training skills, whereas China gets to import to export some of its labor requirements. But that being said, the risks to this significant growth in FDI are the current political environment. As we've seen, China and other international investors are watching the political risk unfold, as well as some other structural challenges, such as their ease, ease of doing business very carefully. E the EPDRF tried to monitor the communist, tried to, excuse me, tried to mimic the Communist Party of China's um, development model, and as such, the relationship grew. With the current uncertainty, uh, the in investment community has cooled a little bit. So we can talk more about that in the recommendation section. Next slide, please. The second issue we, we tackled is land, is land use and management. Ethiopia is, a is hugely dependent on agriculture. 
it's the number one employer and for most people it dry it drives the livelihoods of the vast majority of the population and it's a crucial element to its development as such the way that ethiopia uses and manages its land is incredibly important under the ethiopian constitution the state owns all land individuals that are able to use the land, but the ownership essentially falls to the states. Now the management of that land is, is ceded to the regional governments. So they manage the day-to-day -day interactions with different people. This has had positive effects in the short term, but will lead to some negative effects in the long term. Namely, it's been able to, this type of centralized, centralized approach has been able to encourage significant international investment and creation of and creation. Um, from foreign investors and driven a large part of Ethiopia's recent growth. However, one of the downside of this is that it creates a tremendous amount of uncertainty in Ethiopia, because if you aren't able to guarantee land and property rights, it's not able to be leveraged as a form of capital, which can have a number of different knock-on effects, such as increasing insecurity and not being able to leverage it for credit. Uh, we've seen some of this insecurity manifest in tensions between the regional states and the federal government over boundaries. We've seen also some pastoral rights being largely ignored, as well as forced relocation when certain state actors come in and want to seize land. So next, we'll, the next slide, please. Thank you. Next, we're going to be looking at Ethiopia's privatization efforts and the risks of corruption. As we already previously explained, the economic trajectory that Ethiopia has gone on has been tr truly historic. And in order to keep that momentum going forward, the government has prioritized, in addition to investment and land reform, privatization in order to open up their economy, attract more investors, encourage competition, which, it, which under the effort of encouraging productivity. But there's a, there is a history of centralization in Ethiopia. The EPRDF really spent the last 20 years focusing on a state-led economy to guide investment into certain areas. Also, promotion within the civil service was highly centralized based on political affiliation. Now, as my colleagues have previously mentioned, Ethiopia's major ethnic groups is incredibly diverse. And we've had, there is a history of minority groups being overly represented in terms of investment opportunity and positions for employment. So when we, when we talk about corruption in Ethiopia, we need to be very specific. And what we're talking about is really a system of ethnic-based patronage whereby jobs and opportunities are provided to you, not based on ability, not based on skill, but by which allegiance you have to political parties. The Transparency International actually ranks Ethiopia at 96 out of 108 countries, which is right in the middle of the pack. So there are significant improvements, but really, so when we're talking about Corruption, we're really looking at this idea of an entrenched ethnic based patronage system. Some of the problems with this is that if you're consistently only going to the same group of people, inefficiencies will not be corrected, they'll be further entrenched. Um, and also it discourages the role of private, private corporations who don't have a level playing field will come in and will be, limit, will be less likely to invest this significantly. So next slide, please. So in trying to aggregate our policy recommendations, we really view them as three, as three large objectives. One is to increase dialogue and discussion. Political risk is directly, is directly tied and ethnic tensions are directly tied to the current foreign direct investment trends. So by opening up discussion and discourse, we hope that it will encourage investors to see that there will be a peaceful transition of power. We also need to communicate opportunities to these investors, make it a more opaque, make it a less opaque process so that people within the country and abroad realize that there's systems in place for the, the privatization process to be fair and equal. Next needs some structural reforms to be built in. The government needs to create a capa the capacity to administer land and clarify responsibilities around that, as well as encourage foreign direct investment. Um, in terms of the privatization process, documents should be published and available to see so that everyone can understand what the requirements are and what the policy is. This requires the government to put in place clear and consistent guidance for things such as whistleblower protections for people spotting illicit behavior, as well as a variety of inspector general positions to protect and independently review different processes. 
And then the last is we call for a greater sense of greater engagement. Civil society groups can fill the gap where Ethiopian government can't, whether in terms of training, whether in terms of de conflict de-escalation and land reform, whether it, so we really look for any, any gap to open up the civil society, society to the space to do that. Also, another element of greater engagement is that using foreign direct investment as a way to transfer knowledge and skills. So the more countries that come to invest in Ethiopia, there should also be greater requirements to train and build capacity of local Ethiopians to develop the economy internally. With that, I'll turn over to my colleague Alexis, who will cover international relations. Thank you, Lambert. Good morning. Um, I'm going to cover Ethiopia and international relations. In this section, we have uh, to question the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is to question the Ethiopian Project by Lauren Gilbert. And the second section is the limits and opportunities of the Ethiopia and Eritrea rapprochement by Tenzin Rangal. And then my section is the United States and Ethiopia Partnership Not Programming. Next slide. So this is an image of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, um, shorthand known as the GERD. Um, and in this section, Lauren covered the current uh, negotiations um, and issues related to the development of the dam. So to start, the dam is, it's a gravity dam and it's built on the Blue Nile River in Ethiopia. And it's been under construction since 2001. And it remains a challenge that Ethiopia must resolve. Next slide. And so in this image, you can see Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia, along with US officials in Washington. This was from November 2019. And this is a, a picture that kind of represents the ongoing dispute and negotiations of the GERD. So the, the national interests at stake are the key element behind these ongoing negotiations. So it's steeped in historical rivalries. And it, compete, it highlights competing interests between Ethiopia and Egypt. So both are vying for power over the Nile River. Ethiopia argues that its sovereignty and its right to develop electricity um, and the potential that comes with it uh, is their right. And then Ethiopia or Egypt emphasizes the existential threat in the face of decreased water flows. Um, and the dam has become securitized due to the threats that Egypt has imposed um, on Ethiopia if they are to continue to build uh, the dam. Um, Ethiopia believes that the dam will bring about some of its former glory, but more so it will fill this potential of the country. Um, and in building the GERD, the Ethiopia projects power in a region that upsets previous Egyptian hegemony, and Ethiopia desires to reclaim this sovereignty. It, it wants to do so symbolically through the consolidation of a singular national identity from the various ethnic groups that we spoke about earlier. And so Ethiopians see the dam as an Ethiopian project. And this is largely because a good portion of Ethiopians personally paid for the project through national bonds. It was being built by Ethiopians and it's going to serve Ethiopians. Then there's been very limited international investment for the project. So there exists this domestic political expectation due to personal investment. And with the grid nearly complete after a decade of negotiations, and these uh, disagreements still entrenched in the negotiations over fill rates, there hasn't been a treaty signed yet. Uh, next, or should I hope not yet. Um, and then the, the recommendation that comes with this um, is this idea of a, a water for energy trade scheme, and it uh, should help the mediation process. And the idea is that there should be a guarantee to trade water flows to Egypt and electricity sales to Ethiopia. By compromising on the longer fill rate, Ethiopia will gain time to construct needed uh, power infrastructure and a political cover for producing less electricity than expected. Uh, and then next slide. So then our second topic is the rapprochement with Eritrea. In this photo, you can see Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and Eritrean president Isaiah Safak, and they're embracing at the declaration signing in Asmara, Eritrea in July, 2018. So the background between these two countries is over a half century of tensions um, between Eritrea and Ethiopia. In 1998, there was a war between the two countries and, um, the, and, it's, and the conflict has become the borderlands in between the two countries. 
and it's considered an intractable uh, conflict. So they're neither active or um, in peace. Um, the July 2018 agreement uh, between the two presidents and prime minister uh, was a bilateral summit and it was the first time that the leaders had met in 18 years. Uh, it ended the war, but it didn't implement peace. Um, and Abi is in a unique position because he is a Romo, he's not de Graan, um, and he does not have the same ethnic baggage, so you will, and the historical animosities as past administrations have. Um, so currently, there are territorial concessions agreed to by Abi, but they've been yet to be made. And I'd like to emphasize that Ethiopia hasn't withdrawn troops largely because they're Tigrayan, and the Tigrayan is the border with Eritrea. And so domestically, the Eritrea itself needs to liberalize in order for this peace agreement to work. And if the TPLF wasn't sidelined, uh, even if Abi can make peace, it doesn't mean that Tigrayans and people living on that border, the actual stakeholders, are providing buy-in to this change. Um, so the borderland, which ha was opened, is now closed. Um, and as of January 2020, the Ethiopian government has unofficially changed its asylum policy for Eritreans. Um, and then finally, uh, there is cooperation continuing between Abe and Isaiah, and they've talked uh, cooperation amongst this uh, COVID issues. Um, next slide. So in this image, you can see the disputed territories. Um, so the red is claimed by Eritrea, but awarded to Ethiopia. And then the green is claimed by Ethiopia, but awarded to Eritrea. So four key recommendations moving forward with this uh, peace agreement is to expand and legitimatize the agreement on peace, friendship, and comprehensive cooperation. It's to implement an early warning rapid response system um, in the border areas in order to manage conflict and to prevent violent escalation. And it's the third is to start an informal intra-Tigrayan dialogue between Tigrayas, Tigrayans from Eritrea and Tigrayans from Ethiopia. And then finally, to rely on technical experts from the African Union to clarify the findings of the Border Commission. All right, next slide, please. And then the final section of international relations in Ethiopia is the relationship between the US and Ethiopia, with the key idea being partnership, not programming. So currently, the United States policy towards Af all of Africa's 54 countries fits in a standard rubric um, protect American citizens, strengthen democratic institutions, expand human rights, and spur broad-based economic growth and promote development, and advance regional peace and security. There are two major issues with this statement. First, these goals are too general. Second, they are inconsistent with actual federal funding. So in this camp of too general, these goals lack specificity, originality, and customization. Policy generalization as a method of formulation leads to failed programming and stymied growth in the receiving country. This not only hurts the receiving country, but also the United States due to this misallocation of taxpayer dollars. The United States has the intellectual horsepower uh, to redefine its policy. US aid should be more flexible and determined in consultation with the country of partnership and not programmed in Washington. The second idea is, is, is inconsistent. So while US foreign policy does favor strengthening democracy in rhetoric, congressional budget appropriations do not match. The United States government is not doing what it says it wants to do in African countries. Most funding goes towards health and humanitarian aid, and a minority of it goes towards democracy and human rights programming. Next slide. And so two recommendations for the US government would be to reconstruct its policies and its aid package based on an Ethiopian-led partnership and on Ethiopia's greatest needs. And then the second recommendation would be to decrease the percentage of congressional earmarked foreign aid funding from 90% to 30%, which will end to increase the flexibility in spending at the discretion of the US mission. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to introduce Abebe. Next slide. So this is Abebe, and Professor Sewer spoke a couple words about him in the beginning, but I'll remind you. So he is a senior analyst at the Institute for Strategic Affairs. This is a think tank under the Ministry of Peace of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, where he coordinates the peace and security program, and he researches peace, conflict, and foreign policy. He's also, con he's also currently pursuing his PhD 
in Peace and Security at the Institute for Peace and Security Studies at Addis Ababa University. Abebe was incredibly valuable to us during our time in Addis. He organized our meetings, he provided incredible guidance before and during the trip, and he was a source of uh, lots of information, answered our endless questions, and was just an incredible person to spend two weeks with in Addis. So we are very grateful to Abebe, and with that, we'd love to hear from Abebe about our findings and about our trip. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you, Alexis. C can you hear me? Uh, we one? hear you well, Abebe. Go ahead. Good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you, uh, all the presenters and the, the team. Uh, that was um, a great presentation and a comprehensive uh, report. Uh, uh, that was uh, carried out by all the team. Uh, so I am uh, greatly uh, honored uh, to say that. Uh, in general, uh, the, uh, the report uh, comprehensively indicates that uh, since uh, somehow it goes back to uh, mid 2080, but Majorly, it focused on um, uh, starting from since I became to power, but it focused on, on challenge and uh, the hope uh, uh, that has, uh, has been uh, going on in the country. Uh, after saying this, uh, I wanted to touch uh, some of the points uh, uh, that were uh, the presenters have uh, missed out uh, in, in some points. But uh, for us, Jaina, uh, Jaina's presentation was very comprehensive regarding the security aspect. But one point I wanted to uh, indicate here what uh, Jaina missed out or her, her colleague missed out is the issue of security sector reform in the country. The first thing that Avi came to power, uh, he did that he took significant measure in security sector. He changed the ethos. He changed the leadership and also reformed the institutions in general. But after he did that, he made uh, he faced a severe challenge from the, the process. One, uh, the challenge emerged from the, the constitution. Uh, if, if, if you read from the Article 52G, it states that all regional governments have authorized to establish their security forces. Because of this, for example, the Tigrians, the Oromos, uh, all the nine regional governments have their own security arrangements. Some have paramilitary arrangements, others have like a, a more civilian police approach. For example, if you see the Tigrians side, the Tigrians have more paramilitary kind of security arrangement because of uh, the location they, they, uh, they belong, because the border conflict has not been solved for the last 20 years. Uh, so the, the Tigrayan security arrangement is different from the Somali security arrangement. The Somali borders with Mogadishu, uh, which is failed state since 1991. So they have their own Liu police arrangement which is basically focused on anti-terrorism uh, and the fighting against the redundant group in, in Somalia region. When it comes to the Oromo, the Oromos have their own uh, kind of, which is more focused because they are at the center, uh, the security arrangement basically to address uh, the situations uh, in the center. Uh, the Amara, the, the rest of the region have their own uh, security arrangement, uh, these need to be taken into account. So the point I wanted to make here is, since I will start the report, the major, the major challenge came from uh, this security arrangement is they didn't want to centralize their security forces within uh, or under the, the federal government. Because they, they, they claim that if the federal government 
control the security forces within the region, then it leads, it is against the federal arrangement and it affects their autonomy. Uh, so that is the reason why AVI has uh, a Davis uh, reform uh, in relation to security sector is facing a severe challenge. And now still it's going on. Uh, this needs to be taken into account. Uh, in relation to society, uh, the crisis presentation was great, but uh, one point I wanted to make here is there is a policy during the APRDF, there is a policy called 7030, which means that 70% of uh, uh, the job opportunity uh, within this uh, the industrial part should be allocated to refugees who are from uh, around the neighboring countries because Ethiopia hosted the major, uh, more than 1 million refugees from Eritrea, from Sudan, uh, from Somali, uh, across uh, African uh, regions, it goes down to Yemen uh, and the like. So the Ethiopia government and the European Union had had an arrangement that 70% job opportunity within the industrial part across the country on in the nine regional governments. 70% refuge, I mean, these refugees should get job opportunities. So the finance should come from the European Union and the, the international donors, but 30% of the job opportunities should only go to uh, Ethiopians and the, the local uh, employees. So this is a good beginning. What the problem now we are seeing since uh, the form process is that now, uh, because of the rapprochement with Eritrea, now, uh, some of the, the, the news report that we are hearing here is that the Ethiopian government is attempting to close some refugee camps in, 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 in Tigray region. Some, most of them are from Eritrea. So this created a severe challenge and the challenging the government on both sides and the, the, the international community. If you read the Human Rights Watch report and the, the Christ Group report, it indicates that it is a challenge. Uh, many claims that the relation between Ethiopia and Eritrea is not institutionalized and that it is basically focused on at personal level between the, the two uh, leaders on, on both sides. So this point needs to be included as a challenge uh, since uh, Ethiopia embarked on a uh, uh, reform uh, process. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is on the, the Alexis presentation on international relation issue. Uh, the, the dam issue is still now uh, going on, but Ethiopia, uh, this week Ethiopia declared that it's going to fill the dam. Uh, uh, is planning to fill the dam uh, from starting from July. So now Sudan is, previously it was in between Ethiopia and the uh, the position was clear, uh, but now, yesterday, the Sudanese transitional period prime minister declared that Ethiopia, against Ethiopia's position. Uh, what will happen, I don't know, but from the Ethiopian side, there is clear message delivered to the Sudan and the, to the Egypt. Uh, Ethiopia is ready to take any necessary measures, uh, whatever, uh, costs it, it claims. Regarding the Ethiopia and the Eritrea rapprochement, but uh, still uh, the claim is that this point should be included, I think, in the, in the report, in the Alexis report, because uh, many Ethiopians and Eritreans are saying that the relation between or the rapprochement between Ethiopia and Eritrea is not institutionalized. Basically, it is at personal level. This is the reason why uh, there is a common understanding in the Horn of Africa that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Because Abi wants to consolidate the power at the center. He, he uh, kicked off TPLF from the center. So TPLF was the enemy of uh, Eritrean uh, group. So they both have a common enemy. Uh, the PLF were enemy of uh, 
was considered as enemy for both sides. So they were they were working against one group, which that is why uh, they didn't want to make it institutional uh, is a point. So this this I think is important point need to be uh, addressed in 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 in, uh, in the report. Maybe Alexis, if you consider that. Ethiopia and the Eritrea research relation is good. Yeah, you you clearly made it. Uh, there is lack of clarity. Uh, what kind of policy Eritrea, USA is follow, pursuing towards the horn, uh, particularly to the Ethiopia, uh, needs to be readdressed and reformulated. Uh, still, of course, it lacks in cons consistency and it lacks clarity. But what is Eritrea? USA position toward this reform, uh, what is USA position toward the challenge that the country is facing now, uh, need to be considered uh, thoroughly because now it has regional implication, it has national implication in, in, in peace process uh, and, and in four process in general. In general, you have all co covered all the challenge, all the problems and um, your recommendations are, some of the recommendations are very necessarily and very important, but the, child, the problem is, can the government take into account and the, can the government implement those recommendations as you're mentioning? Because during the January, your, your time of visit in Ethiopia, the issue and the, the agenda of the country was different from the agenda that is running in the country. Before COVID-19, the agenda was about institutionalization, making the government accountable to the, the refugee issue, the IDP issue, the economy issue, uh, the inclusivity issues, the civil society agendas uh, were uh, the top. But now following the COVID-19, and the, now the, the agenda in the country is the dam issue. Now there is high uncertainty what will happen in the country because of this, uh, the position, uh, Ethiopia's position towards the dam. And also the election issue is still the burning issue. There are two running positions in, the, in relation to election. The Prosperity Party, the Abiy government took the, the constitutional, uh, is trying to take constitutional uh, uh, measures uh, to postpone the election because uh, to have election uh, is very difficult. It was supposed to happen in August, but uh, it postponed because of the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So Abiy government is planning to postpone and they took the constitution uh, to push forward, but the other group is claiming that no, we cannot push forward the election. We need to have inclusive negotiation on when the election is going to happen, how the election is, is, is going to take place. Because in September uh, 25, the, the current government ends. Then the legitimacy will be questioned if election is not made in the country and if there is no negotiations among all opposition groups, including the civil societies. Uh, the problem uh, will be uh, difficult to manage uh, in the country. So these are the agendas that are going on in the country. So maybe at, at uh, your recommendation, uh, maybe if you consider uh, these challenges that are uh, running in the country, in general, I'm very happy uh, to hear that you all captured all the problems, the challenge, and the, you, you made a great job. Uh, thank you for giving this opportunity to, to say a few words about uh, your, your report. Thank you, Abebe. That was great. And uh, you uh, are continuing to keep us honest, and we appreciate that. Uh, let me uh, start the Q&A, but remind you to identify yourselves uh, when you pose questions, including not just your name, but also your affiliation if you have one, and to do it in the Q&A function, not in the chat function. Uh, but I do have a first question 
in the chat function, I'm afraid, from, uh, if I can, if I can stop things from popping around on my screen. Uh, Paulette uh, Lee, who has previously been a World Bank communications contractor in Ethiopia and communications instructor at the University of Addis Ababa Graduate School of Journalism, uh, and a volunteer at the Ethiopian Women's Lawyers Association, asks about the status of women under the new administration. Uh, I'm wondering, Aaron Sullivan, whether you would like to take that on. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Professor. Um, and uh, thank you, Ms. Lee, for the question. We were lucky to um, actually get to meet with a representative of the Ethiopian Women's Lawyers Association. We were in Addis, Alensa Vieni, who was wonderful. Um, I think that there have been um, some positive developments in terms of the rhetoric and in terms of some actions taken by the Abi government with regard to women in Ethiopia. Um, the not probably one of the most high profile steps is um, his appointment of a women's rights activist to lead the Supreme Court, who I think was also a founder of EULA. Um, at the same time, um, in order to see real progress for uh, women in, in any country, and in Ethiopia in particular, I think there has to be a, an institutionalization of, um, of rights and of it's sort of a fair, a fair judicial system that will hear, um, hear and adjudicate sort of disputes or uh, infractions of women's rights fairly. Um, and I'm not sure that when we were in Addis, from the people we spoke to, I'm not sure that that has yet been happening. Um, there are also uh, social, social and cultural barriers, especially in rural areas, uh, to women's education and political participation. Um, the amendment of the civil society law um, is, I think, a hopeful step with regard to, with regard to potentially allowing civil society to play an important role in um, addressing some uh, social and cultural barriers to uh, to women's status in Ethiopia. Um, however, so uh, that's positive, but yet to be seen, um, you know, will those freedoms for civil society continue, and will the civil society organizations, you know, really fill, uh, step in to fill that role, and what sort of impact will they be able to make? Um, there are, I, on the legal side, which is what my paper focused on, you know, we, de we heard that, um, and this photo that just came up is actually from our meeting at uh, EULA. Um, the, uh, on, on the legal side of things, um, we, we heard that, you know, women can face um, corruption problems in court. So in domestic disputes, women may come in and then the, uh, a husband will pay a bribe to the judge and the case is dismissed without uh, justice being done for the woman. That's a problem with the legal system. In, uh, in more traditional informal legal adjudication um, in rural areas of the country or in towns and villages of the country, often um, even though those institutions have you know, some more trust than the formal judiciary in some communities, uh, they may still be led by boards of elders who uh, and women are excluded from those. So there's not even necessarily going to be full representation for women in, in the smaller community-based um, uh, justice administration. So I think there, there's work to be done. However, there are positive um, sounds coming out of the government and um, the Abiy government. And so yet to be seen. But I do think that, that certainly judicial reform and legal reform is, is an important step for women in Ethiopia. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Do I have others who wanted to contribute on that subject? If not, I will go to the next question, which comes from Mohammed Elbaf-Beltaji, uh, who asks, how do you see Egyptian-Ethiopian relations developing in this year in the context of the GERD? And Lauren Gilbert, I think uh, that's probably for you. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I had a few comments about this. First being that in the light of the COVID-19 situation, it becomes very uncertain, and Abebe mentioned this, 
um, a lot of what we saw and the directions we were able to kind of get a sense of in January are now in many ways being postponed. Um, but I still wanted to offer a few comments. The first being in light of recent developments within the past week, if not past few days, with Sudan refusing to sign the partial agreement and Ethiopia appearing to continue on its desire to begin filling um, the, re the reservoir in July. Now with this insistence, um, we have a disconnect between the parties and this was all brought on by the fact that Egypt took its concerns to the UN. And so we once again raised this problem to an international level, not just a tripart level. And with the COVID-19 issues, even though Sudan is calling for the parties to immediately re-begin re re um, negotiations, it's incredibly difficult to have those meetings. And there's been some talk about trying to do that on a virtual setting, but there appears to be little traction. So with all this in mind, um, I personally would think that we are going to see Ethiopian and Egyptian relations become much more tense. Um, we have seen Ethiopia in the past continue to move forward on the GERD when it received opposition, um, and it has done so unilaterally. So I would not be surprised if we did see the GERD begin filling in July, despite not having Sudan or Egypt on board. Um, that said, this is also an interesting time for COVID-19 because of disruptions in the global supply chain. I am not fully aware of how the materials to complete the very last bit of the dam um, are in the process, whether they're already on the ground or they're awaiting shipment, but should they be delayed in any way due to these new breakdowns in global supply chain, we may see uh, a delay in the filling or a slower filling, which could appease Egypt to some extent. Um, and we saw quite a few uh, movements in negotiations in February and in March where they said to have resolved several large issues, but still have a few remaining. So in my personal opinion, we will see this worsen before it gets better, but depending on how the COVID-19 situation plays out, we could see um, negotiations re-engage or a partial agreement be signed by all three on the previously negotiated items. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, let me turn to some questions now about Tigray that come from Welda Tika. Uh, one of them I'm going to answer, why did you not visit Tigray? Uh, and the answer is, I'm afraid that we simply didn't have the financial resources uh, or the time, but mainly the financial resources uh, to leave Addis except uh, for uh, two half days out of the capital uh, to local communities, but we didn't have the resources to fly to Tigray and to stay there for a few days. Uh, if, if we had had additional resources, I think that would have been among our top priorities. So I think you're quite right in suggesting that ideally we should have gone to Tigray. But well, the Tika also asks, uh, uh, are people, Aren't people still being arrested uh, because of their politics? And isn't the media broadcasting hate speech against the Tigrayans? So, uh, Chris, I wonder if you can answer uh, about hate speech, maybe also about the, uh, the question of arrests for political purposes. Um, sure, thanks. I mean, I'll, I can definitely answer the, the first question about hate speech. Um, you know, hate speech is something that, you know, seems to be being um, perpetuated by kind of, you know, individual actors. You know, it's, it's, it's obviously hard to, um, to, you know, know exactly who's, um, you know, posting these things because, you know, uh, you, you can have like anonymous accounts on, on, twi on Twitter, et cetera. Um, but, you know, we found that, it, you know, it was not the Ethiopian government. And actually, uh, I believe one human rights activist uh, said that a lot of the hate speech comes from, from abroad, from the di diaspora. And so he viewed um, the recent uh, law, anti-hate speech law, um, that is pretty broad and basically, um, you know, 
can uh, put people in jail um, if they are accused of, you know, um, even like sharing hate speech. Uh, so he said that that's something that he did not think was very realistic because um, according to him, most of the hate speech is actually coming from abroad. And, you know, the Ethiopian government doesn't have jurisdiction to arrest people that are posting on Twitter um, outside of the country. So he viewed that as, as a, a problem with this law. Um, but, you know, what I will say is, yeah, we did not get the sense that this is um, being uh, perpetuated by the government. It is true that the Abiy administration seems to have kind of, um, you know, sidelined some, some prominent, uh, you know, uh, members of the TPLF. Um, that's something that the uh, government did early on in Abiy's, um, you know, uh, rule, but, you know, definitely not something that the Ethiopian government is, um, is doing. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the arrest of political prisoners uh, in Tigray, I don't know, uh, Tenzin, maybe you might have a, a better idea uh, about that than I do. Tenzin, would you like to respond on that? Sorry, yeah. Um, so that wasn't necessarily the focus of my research, but I would say that um, in meeting the Tigrayans that we did get the chance to meet in Addis, um, there were lots of feelings that they were being disproportionately targeted and marginalized. Um, and so I feel like there is a sense that there, um, there is injustice towards them specifically targeting them because they are Tigrayan. But um, again, like the professor mentioned, we weren't able to visit Tigray. So I think that we have a very small sample size in order to um, kind of reflect on that. Thank you. Uh, Samu with Walda Michael asks, uh, what about looking at privatization from poor people's perspectives and interests? Is it really in the interest of the poor uh, to privatize? Uh, I, I suppose, uh, Lambert, that this might be for you. Yeah, I can elaborate a bit on that. So privatization is one of the government's basically new plans to continue the engine of growth. You know, it is, it is undeniable that the EPDRDF were able to lift a massive amount of people out of extreme poverty over the last 10 years while posting significant economic growth in double digits. They engaged in a series of economic reform, of educational reforms across the country that really built tons of universities. So in terms of lifting a lot of people out of challenging conditions of poverty, you know, the EPRDF's success is notable, um, but in order to continue that success uh, and to transition the economy away from a largely agrarian agricultural economy to a more industrialized model, one of the steps that Ethiopia is going to need to make is to open up its economy. Now, when we say privatization, and this is one of the subjects of my research, the goal is to not essentially earmark sectors and industries of the economy to certain people based on certain requirements. The goal is to encourage investment, increase efficiency through uh, increase efficiency through greater competition, and that this will have a trickle down effect to create more jobs. It's no coincidence that one of the primary places that they're first looking to do privatization is the telecommunications sector. Ethiopia is a country of 110 million people, 70% of which are under the age of 30. And this is largely a generation that's grown up with comfort and experience around telecommunication. So they're hoping is that by opening up telecommunication, the services will be, will be better and this will create new jobs for people as well as a lot of corollary and what we would call knockoff industries. So knock-on industries. So essentially someone wants to start an IT business or a servicing business, they'll be able to do that with a, a better telecommunication landscape. So you know, that's, that's really what, what the government is looking at in the role of privatization is to continue this economic growth forward and help transform the economy. Thank you very much. May uh, I add a bit to that, Professor Server? Please, who's that? This is Abby. Hi, Abby, please do add. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I would add only that I think what, something that I noticed in many of our conversations about economic liberalization and privatization was a real uh, recognition and concern about the um, social effects of, um, of many of these economic measures. And I, I felt that there, as many of us experienced as well, um, there were not many clear answers on that. So as much as the economic 
and political actors are pushing forward for these reforms, um, it seemed that there was a very large un un unanswered question about the social effects of um, inequality and on poor people, et cetera. So I wanted to just add that. Yes, I, I, I agree. And in particular, in certain sectors like banking, where opening up the market and allowing uh, foreign banks in could have dramatic effects on uh, employment in that sector or even in telecom. Uh, we didn't get a lot of good answers there, but I'm not sure there are, are any easy answers. I have a question from Lawrence Freeman, a political economic ana analyst for Africa, who asks, do you think that regional ethnic federalism put forth in the 95 constitution rather than the conception of one Ethiopian people under a sovereign nation is contributing to ethnic difficulties today? And I thought I might ask Ricardo if you want to respond to that. Ricardo, are you with us? I may not have Ricardo with me. Uh, Ryan, would you like to say a word about that? Um, sure. Uh, I mean, at least in the case of Oromia, I think that's um, that that's at least partially true. I mean, the the ethnic federalist system is kind of built on this conception of of ethnic autonomy in each of these regions, um, and you know, I think. There, there was a bit of a catch-22 when they established the, the Constitution in 1995. If they, they needed to establish some level of national peace and national order, and they achieved that through having these this ethnic federalist model. Um, but that does entrench and legalize um, kind of ethnicity as, as the building block of identity, and that, that does get in the way of building a national identity, um, especially when you have situations of um, minorities within each of these regional governments um, not having uh, uh, full rights. Um, so being limited in who they can, whether they can vote, um, uh, access to, to economic opportunity, the ability to invest. Um, so kind of all, all of this, not, not only does it impact kind of the building of national identity, but it also causes very real proximate tensions um, within each of these regional states. Thank you very much, Ryan. Ricardo, I'm showing you as available. Do you want to add something to that? Uh, sorry, the connection is really bad, so I didn't actually hear the question, and I, I got kicked out of the meeting. So oh. I, I, I... The question is about the tension between the ethnic federalist constitution and uh, the idea of Ethiopians as one people. Does that cause problems? Yeah, so I, I, I talked about that in my chapter. Um, basically, you know, looking at the prosperity party bylaws, it's pretty evident that there is a clear switch and there's a lot more mention of individual rights. And I think, you know, uh, the rationale behind uh, Prime Minister Abiy's uh, what I call the peace pact was the fact that he understood the potential for ethnic uh, strife because you know like the situation in the, uh, in the 1990s was very different from the one that was you know back in 2015 2016 and at the beginning as Ryan was mentioning from what I heard the PDF was a really good way of stabilizing the country after you know very long civil war and uh, the TPLF decided to speak ahead but then after the time, I mean if we want to go back to 2005 I mean there were already some protests there and he understood the situation was really unstable. And so I think, you know, there is, there is a decisive switch that can be seen uh, from, a, from a sort of like decentralized perspective to a much more centralized one. And the rationale was trying to stabilize the country. But what they ended up doing was actually bringing to the fore some um, very basic questions and issues about it. I'm afraid, Ricardo, we're, we're losing you, Ricardo. Uh, your connection is not a good Okay, well, um, I, I'm afraid we have to abandon the rest of the response from Ricardo. I'm, 
I've got a question uh, from Ethiopia, from one of our uh, interlocutors in Ethiopia, Chief Inspector Medareshaw Tafese from the Ethiopian Police University, who thanks us for our visit there, and we were delighted to visit there. His question is in relation to security and law enforcement. Uh, how is it feasible to integrate regional and federal forces in uh, from the federal states when policing really is is decentralized? And I think that's for you, Rachel. Rachel is in Tokyo. I'm hoping that her connection is a good one. Yes, I think that uh, Japanese technology means that the internet really should be working. Um, so firstly, thank you for hosting us at the Police University. We had a great day when we were there. Um, we learned a lot from our visit there about the challenges that Ethiopia's police face. Uh, each of the regions, each of the regional police forces have paramilitary capabilities that kind of are attached to their regional police forces, which can pose a risk when those forces are ethnically aligned and they don't necessarily serve all Ethiopians. And some of those uh, ethnic forces have added thousands of troops in recent years. Um, but you're right, demilitarizing those groups, integrating those paramilitaries into regional, into regular regional police or into federal forces presents a huge challenge. Uh, it's going to require a lot of diplomacy, uh, particularly in an environment where ethnic nationalism is on the rise and has resulted in violence. So I think regional presidents will probably need to be supportive. Ethnic leaders will need to be brought on board. Um, I think there's still a significant role for regional police to play. They have links in the community and that was what was envisaged by the constitution. Um, but I think there is a need to either either demilitarize or federalize the paramilitary capabilities that the regional police currently have um, because they're ethnically aligned and they present a threat when those regional forces build up. Some have launched border incursions, some have failed to protect or target, failed to protect ethnic minorities or have actually targeted ethnic minorities. It's going to take a long time uh, and in the meantime regional forces need to be professionalized uh, and their constitutional training and human rights training need to be improved. Um, and I wrote in my paper, at least, that your university needs more resources uh, to train police professionally uh, and to serve, to know to serve all Ethiopians, regardless of, of their ethnicity. Uh, so thanks very much for your question and thanks for hosting us. Thank you, Rachel. I have a number of questions about uh, Prime Minister uh, Abiy Ahmed and whether he's legitimate, whether he's uh, taking the country towards dictatorship, whether he's trying to avoid elections. Uh, uh, maybe I can turn to uh, you, Ryan, or one of the people in your section to, to uh, consider that question. Is there a risk that, uh, that uh, Abiy Ahmed, whom the West has uh, greeted with glee, I would say, uh, and certainly words of support, uh, uh, is there a risk that he, in fact, is imposing a new dictatorship? Um, I'm not sure I would quite put it in those terms. Um, there's definitely the perception that the centralization of authority under the, the Prosperity Party um, is is quite top down, quite centralized, quite atis focused, and not focused on the regions, um, and and that's kind of created a lot of consternation. Um, I think a, a big issue that that will need to be addressed is is how institutionalized those those changes are, and how how broad and how deep they are as they're implemented. Um, I mean, the EPRDF, just as, a, as an administrative structure, is, is huge. I mean, it's millions of party members um, at regional and local, mem at local levels. It extends throughout the entire country. And so I think the, perhaps a, a bigger risk than um, kind of the emergence of a new dictatorship is the kind of inconsistent implementation of these reforms um, because they're being kind of decided upon at a, a somewhat isolated um, 
top level when they really need to be implemented through um, hundreds of thousands of um, civil service personnel, security force members throughout the country, that that is simply a, a huge administrative challenge um, that the prime minister will have to um, surmount. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Peter Lewis, the uh, director of our African Studies program, uh, asks uh, a question that I, requires a little bit of imagination of us. Uh, he asks, can we envision alternative scenarios of a positive reform trajectory or a more negative pathway? What would each scenario look like? Uh, I'm tempted, uh, Rachel, to turn to you for a negative pathway. Uh, and um, uh, I think Ryan actually just outlined uh, the potential for a positive pathway that's much more broader based and inclusive. But Rachel, can you uh, maybe chime in? Have I lost? Yes, so, no, you've got me, sorry. Um, so it's a horrible thing to talk about, but it is, it is possible that ethnic violence could increase, uh, particularly when there is a buildup of military and paramilitary capabilities in the regions. Uh, like, uh, like we've heard from our other presenters, there has been increased hate speech uh, and there's some uh, more active political leaders that are uh, spurring people on to protest and to commit acts of violence. So, uh, on top of that, uh, you know, the, the Prime Minister does face a lot of challenges and may not be able to uh, use the Prosperity Party as a way to, of reaching out to other ethnic groups. So if at the top where we're seeing some divides and then in the regions we're seeing some divides, I can see one, one, uh, one timeline uh, looking pretty unfortunate as violence increases. And there may be a, uh, an overreaction or a knee-jerk reaction uh, and an allowance for the police or military forces to resort to or return to uh, human rights abuses or excessive use of force to control violence because the security sector really isn't in a position at the moment where it has alternatives to that kind of uh, force. So if ethnic violence increased, I could see the security forces not being able to necessarily respond. I really hope that other people have a uh, better timeline than that one that they want to put forward. Jonathan, I, I uh, wonder if I can turn to you because your look at the Sidama referendum raised some serious questions about electoral administration. Yeah, um, so are you looking for a rosy outlook or a more- I'm looking for outlook? the risks, the risks. Oh, about the risks involved? Yeah, the risks involved definitely are, as we've seen currently in politics throughout Ethiopia, everything has become focused on ethnicity and ethnicity seems to be the galvanizing mechanism to get people to turn out. And when that occurs, the big issue that ten, the big issue that crops up is voter suppression and the different mechanisms that can be used to either reduce turnout amongst minorities within certain regions, either through intimidation or violence, or you have the the opposite of that, where you look to boost the numbers of those within your own ethnic group by over by over registering voters through nefarious means and the recent Ethiopian election law kind of gave way to a loophole where that's possible because if you no longer have the proper identification card all you need is three other people in that community to vouch that you are of a particular age it, and vouch that you are of a particular age and then then you are able to take part in the voting process and what happened in Sadama is through this loophole you tended to see a lot of underage voting and on top of all this is has mentioned before we have a massive youth unemployment problem and you have a lot of you have a lot of and 
certain ethnic leaders are able to mobilize and activate the grievances within with in these youth groups to foster violence therefore leading to a more chaotic electoral process and an electoral process that it that has many issues thank you very much jonathan uh, isabel keep me honest here are we supposed to end at 11. i believe our time is running out yes our, our time is running out we have a wonderful set of questions left. I'm hoping that there's some way of preserving them and asking the students to uh, respond to some of them uh, directly. Uh, all I can say is that this has been a wonderful opportunity to discuss Ethiopia in some depth. There's been relatively little discussion in Washington, uh, even before COVID-19 hit. Uh, uh, Zoom has enabled us now to do it with some participation from Ethiopia and much broader participation internationally than we have had in private prior sessions. So I'm, I'm thinking Zoom is a permanent fixture in our future uh, for reports on these study trips. But I want to thank all the students. I want to thank Abebe Ainete again, and I want to thank Isabel Telpain Long again for making this uh, truly extraordinarily exciting experience for us. And uh, the report, I hasten to add, will be available, is available, I believe, already on the, on the SICE website. Uh, I'll hope that we can send out an announcement of the report. Uh, I, I have read and reread many times uh, the papers, and I think they're really quite wonderful. And uh, I look forward uh, to SAIS keeping an eye on Ethiopia, a terribly important country, uh, not just this year, but in the future as well. Thank you all. Thank you to the participants. Uh, and I uh, wish you all health and safety in this difficult time. Thank you very much.